Hey, everybody, this is Ramon Ray, founder of SmartHustle.com. Thanks for joining me for another exciting podcast where we inspire and educate small business owners to start and grow successful businesses so they can provide for their families and support their communities and live the lives they want. If you're hearing the sound of my voice or maybe watching this video, please give us a five-star review, 5,000-star review. I don't care, 4.9, that'll even work, but we're so glad that you're here joining us today. Today, I'm pleased and have the pleasure of talking to this gentleman in the green room before we hit record, Jay Steinfeld, uh, CEO and founder of Blinds.com and author of the book, Lead from the Core, The Four Principles for Profit and Prosperity, Jay Steinfeld. And also, I must say, Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year and a lot of other accolades. Jay, Thanks for joining us today. I hope your day has been well as we're recording this and that your family and those important to you are lovely and doing well. How are you, Jay? I'm doing great, Ramon. Thanks for having me. And I must say, you have a lot of energy. <laughs> what can I say? God gave somebody a lot of brains and, and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a less, uh, you know, anyhow, thank you. Let me just say, thank you <laughs> for the compliment. I appreciate the kind of word. Jay, no, it's going to be fun. So let's start into it. I'm sure half of America or everybody in the world knows of blinds.com. We'll get there, this huge, huge brand, but it's always led by a great team of people and you're the founder and CEO of that. But I want to go way back. You know, we talked about some things offline that were really cool. Help us understand, just unpack a bit, Jay, riff with us. Where did it begin? And if you don't mind, even not where did it begin business? Tell us a bit about you and that backstory personally. Then let's dive into Jay, the business person, if that's cool with you. Tell that's us a bit about you. Well, it, I'm going to spend very little time on myself. Uh, the, I think the, the important things are that I was a CPA. Okay. I studied accounting because I was told by people who were successful that you had to know numbers. So I studied accounting. And by the way, I hate accounting. I, hate, <laughs> I worked for one of the big firms, KPMG, uh, Pete Marwick. I hate it every day. But it was a means to an end, but mm -hmm. I, and it, was, it was good advice. Study numbers, study accounting. It was a great foundation for one day being in business. Well, I was a VP of finance of Meineke Discount Mufflers, the national franchise. And that was a good job until I was fired. That was, that was not good. I was fired from the UN. I know that feeling. Go ahead, though. Yeah, it, was, it, was, it was actually one of the best things that ever happened to me in retrospect. Right. Well, my wife had this little shop called Laura's Draperies. And of course, her name is Naomi. Okay. So Naomi had the store, Laura's Draperies, and it was a shop at home store. So mm -hmm. people would go to, uh, she would get in her van and go to people's homes and help them decide what's the best window treatment, what's the best blind. So I thought, hmm, I'm a CPA. Perfect. I'll sell blinds. So I opened up a second Why store. not? I know, exactly. So we got another van, and I started doing that too. Nice. No training at all. I knew nothing. But it started actually percolating and doing pretty well. And then, in that was 1987 when we started. In 1993, I heard of something called the Information Superhighway, the World Wide Web. That's and I right. thought, what is that? Uh, I had no idea what it was. Now, I am not a tech person. I am not a visionary. All I am is an experimenter. And I thought, hmm, I will try to set up a website. $1,500 later, and a local guy created a website for me. Can, can I ask you, though, Jay, why did you want to do it? Because that does share something. Now it's easy to say in hindsight, of course. But since you said some things you're not, can you think about why you did that? Because that was very purposeful. You could have been one of the people that were like, that's for the young people, those stupid people. But something caused you to want to do a website back then. That is revolutionary. You know, back well, then. I was, I was younger back then. Sure. So I, okay. I was one of those young people. But all it was, I, I, what I've realized is I like to tinker. Okay. I like to experiment. And this was a marketing experiment and nothing. It was just like an ad. I could have spent $3,000 for a Houston Chronicle ad. Mm -hmm. you know, I live in Houston. Or I could spend $1,500 for a website. I didn't know what it was. I had no idea what it was going to be. And we didn't sell anything on, this, on the site. Mm -hmm. All it was was a brochure. I wanted to look progressive. I wanted to look like I had the most current styles in draperies. And maybe people would get on there and set up an appointment. But they weren't going to buy anything. 
there was no e-commerce. I didn't even know you could sell things online. Well, Amazon launched the next year in 1994. And I thought, huh, you can sell stuff online. You can sell books. Because that's all they were selling was books. I thought, all right, I've got this great idea. Let's, let's sell blinds online, even though they can't see them, they can't touch them, they can't choose their color. Oh, and we're going to make them measure it themselves and install it themselves. Wow. So, of course, everybody said, that is like the stupidest idea I have ever heard. And our manufacturers wouldn't even sell to us mm -hmm. because they thought we were idiots. Well, I, I did launch it, and I wanted to make buying blinds and shades a no-brainer. And this was now 1996, mm -hmm. three years later after tinkering Tink, tinkering with uh, Laura's. And to make it a, a no brainer, I called it No Brainer Blinds. No Brainer Blinds. And we were number one. So we were at the time the world's most popular and trusted online source for blinds because we were the only one selling blinds. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, was, it was a, a dinky little site. It had three products and two colors. And in fact, it was so bad. The technology was so bad that people had to actually type in their, their prices in a box. Oh. And they had to manually add up those prices and compute the sales tax and compute the total. That, that compared to today, Jay, yeah, I'll agree with you. That is pretty bad. But hey, in hindsight, it was probably the coolest thing around. But continue. I love this. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't cool, but I think there is a lesson here for small yeah. business owners. You don't have to have the perfect solution when you yeah. start. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of something called MVP. That's right. Minimum viable product. Mm -hmm. That means you just create something just enough to get it into the market and see what customers think. Then you can adjust not by what you think, right. but what your customers think. Well, this was not MVP. This was HVP, hardly viable product. So we did it. And eventually people were buying. Now, how did it work? Again, HVP. They would call into the Laura's showroom because I kept my day job. I'm still doing Laura's draperies. Yes. This was just a side hustle. And what, what they do is they say, all of our customer service representatives are busy. Well, I'm the service representative. Right. I'm the only person. I'm the whole company. You're the ultimate hustle, man. You are. That is the hustle. <laughs> so they'd call me in my van and I go, oh, there's, we got somebody. Like I think my, I remember the first one was from Kansas. Like mm -hmm. somebody called. This is awesome. So I was on the freeway and I pulled off to the side on the freeway in the emergency. And I took my first sale from my car on the freeway with an order pad and this giant phone. And that's how it started. And I did that for a few years until I finally got a couple of other people and just built it slowly one customer at a time until we actually started doing some serious damage and we were, we, we beat Amazon, we beat Home Depot, we beat Lowe's. I mean, we had the lion's share of the market. And Jay, can you tell me before you go on, the iteration of the website, I'm curious, um, how did that work? I'm sure there are big leaps, but like the way you have to manually put it in. In six months later, two years later, can you talk about some of the big leaps of the back end? I'm curious how that happened, you know, because that's all the customer would see. I'm sure there's a lot of things in the office, but from that little screen, what, how often did you iterate and do it better and better? Was it slow or did it happen pretty quick? Well, some things were slow and some things were fast. Uh, in 2001, I decided, you know, I'm doing a million and a half dollars in my store and I'm working seven days a week, like 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a million and a half online with- million and a half months. per year, per week, per month? Per year, per okay. year. Oh yeah, that was a lot. Okay. <laughs> I remember one saying, God, if we could just do like, a thousand dollars a month. Yeah, that would be awesome. So we um, uh, we in two thousand one decided I'm getting rid of the store. I will never have a store again. Of course, for, fourteen years later, I I sell the company to Home Depot, and now I've got twenty two hundred stores. That's another story, and that's that's much later. Mm -hmm. But here I am now selling the store full time online, two employees. And we buy a company in St. Augustine, Florida, that was actually now doing more than we were. We were doing a million and a half. They were doing three million. And he was working out of his home with his family, just like I was working. Well, wow. I was working out of a small little shop. And the, he had technology that I didn't have. And that's, that was why you wanted to join together and buy him? Is that? Yes. Okay. So we bought them one for the sales 
And secondly, for the technology, which I could then take and then integrate it into my own site. And then boom, we went from four and a half to nine to 12 to 15. We then bought another company that was doing 18. That got us to 33. We went to 48, 50, 75. We bought another company for 20 that was doing 25 million. Now we're at 100 million. And then we get up to 115 million and Home Depot says, enough. You guys are kicking our butt. We're buying you. I love it. Yeah. And when companies do things like that, way more than that now, it's yes. unbelievable. It's crazy. When companies buy large companies like that, what are some of the back end reasons that it happens? Meaning, is it clearly? I get it. You're the you're a competitor, but they clearly wanted to leverage it somehow. They were thinking we can like Shark Tank. Is it? You know, if I'm wrong, Jay, tell me. But we can add gasoline to this and turn it up to 115 to a billion. Is that the kind of essence that goes on when big leaders are thinking of big purchases? Is that some of the things they're that, thinking of? Or? That definitely happens. I'm not sure that's what they were thinking. Okay. They were thinking, okay, they're the leader. Right. We are the number one online. I mean, we're the number one home retailer in sure. the world. So why shouldn't we buy the number one Got it. retailer in blinds, especially when we're kicking their butts? Yep. So yeah, the combination, I felt like I and we, blinds.com was right. Tony Stark and that they were Jarvis in the suit and together we would be Iron Man. I love it. That's, love that's it. the way I felt like it. And, and we did have some effect on them. And of course they had an effect on us, but it was, it really was a beautiful partnership. And this is a situation where not only did I sell them and it was a, it was a really good financial outcome for sure. And I'm blessed and grateful that it happened, but I stayed on seven years after selling to Home Depot mm -hmm. as the CEO of blinds.com and also joined the whole, the online leadership team of Home Depot. That was an awesome experience. Yeah. And yes, they helped me become a, even a better leader with their operational efficiency and all their systems and processes and the way they analyze things. That helped me see things in a different way. We show them how to have customer intimacy and have this type of technology that really cared first about people. And it's not that Home Depot doesn't care about people, but their, their, their focus first is on operational efficiency, supply chain, things like that. And our first thing is about people. We're always thinking, how do we help people become the best that they can be? Mm. And if our focus was on that, and then you have this operational efficiency and you merge that together, it's a beautiful thing. And it was, it was great. It was fantastic. I can and hear the, the joy in your heart, Jay. <laughs> I know, but I'm not even there anymore. <laughs> I stepped away last year in, in May. Yeah. And that's another thing that... You build it, they're like, it was like another child. I have five kids. This is like my sixth kid. And when, when, you, you, when you're building a life, what you want is for them to be resilient and yes. self-reliant and independent and as autonomous as possible. And that's what I was doing with Blinds.com, with Home Depot and with the leadership that we had. And Home Depot gave us a tremendous amount of autonomy to their credit. They allowed us to flourish. And by, by flourishing and being ourselves, we were able to create something. And because I knew that the people within blinds.com had embedded in them the core values that had previously made us what we are, and I knew who my successor was, and I knew what I was gonna be doing afterwards, it gave me the, the peace of mind to step away in May of 2020. And now they're doing even better without me, which is awesome. And, and by and the way, what, what did you? <laughs> people within it are flourishing within the company or they've left to form their own companies yes, yes. or they're, they're executives at other companies. And what is better as a leader than creating other leaders? I mean, that is the job of a leader, to create leaders. And when you see these people flourishing on their own, whether they're in your company or out, man, I just sat back and go, oh, like a proud dad or granddad, right? It's, it's so yeah. proud. every yeah. single one of them. Yeah. It's, 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 it's really when I think about the most successful thing that's ever happened, it's the people who have gotten who started at a, such a low level and have flourished to become leaders either in the company or outside. It's by far the teams that were created and what they've been able to become better than what they ever believed possible. I've become better than what I ever believed possible. And that's, that's what I'm trying to impart to everyone else. How do you help people become the best they can be? And I know I can be even better.
I know I can be a lot better because I find things wrong or my wife tells me there's things wrong of things that I can, I can be improved upon. And I'll tell you that's one, one more thing. Please. The success, my su definition of success is not about achieving something or it's something extrinsic like that. It's about being in the process of getting better. Yeah. Definition of success is being in the process of getting better and helping people around me get better. And that means you can be successful every day. If you just get a little bit better, that's success. If you can help somebody else get just a little bit better, that's success. In fact, I'm saying not only can you be successful every day, but you can be successful multiple times during the day because certainly there's a lot of things that you can improve upon and help other people. And this, I'm not saying this from an altruistic way, a benevolent way. It's just common sense. Good business is improving and improving others. And if you can continue to do that, you have an organization that is almost, it's like autonomous excellence. It's just happening independently of anything that you're saying that they need to do because people are improving themselves. They're improving everybody around them. And why would somebody leave from a, an organization like that? And our turnover was only 8%. Look, I could go on and on and on, obviously, about this, because I'm so pumped about what's happened and where I am and how I can be on your show, Ramon, and help other people do this. And really, that's, that's the whole point of the book. Lead from the Core is about taking all these lessons that help Blinds.com go from my garage, actually, from my car. To yeah, my let's remember, uh, Laura, let's remember from the car. <laughs> car to garage to a startup, to a legitimate business, to an enterprise business, to be integrated with Home Depot. And in that book are all the lessons that got us there so that other people can do the same thing. It's, it's time to give back. And that's what that book does. And by the way, I bought the book. I hope others look at the book as well. Leads from the core, the four principles for profit and prosperity. Uh, I, I assume some of what you shared already is inside that book. And I was going to ask you to unpack one or two lessons, but is that some of the principles that we just talked about that you just shared? Are they yeah, in there? evolving for sure and experimenting? I've hinted about, you know, I'm an experimenter and evolving. I actually have four E's and I'll make this short. No, please. Four e's. Uh, one is evolve okay. continuously. I, that's obvious. Two is experiment without fear of failure. Third is express yourself. That means you express yourself and you create an environment where everybody has a voice and that you get as diverse a workplace as you possibly can so you can get the most diverse opinions. And when you have diverse cognitive ability where everybody feels comfortable and safe to give their opinion, not because not just because they're safe, but because you respect them and that you want the information. You're not just trying to get buy-in. You really want their opinion so that you can evolve and that you can figure out where you should experiment. And the fourth E is enjoy. Enjoy the ride. Look, when you are doing something that you've never done before, that people said was impossible, mm. where you're actually being consequential and you have a significant role, then that's fun. Yes, we had foosball, we celebrated, we did all that stuff, ping pong tables, giant uh, lava lamps. But fun for us was doing things and creating things that had never been created and getting people who are like-minded, who already within their, within their hearts, within their DNA are people who evolve, who like to take small incremental chances who like to express themselves, who, who don't want to be timid about their view, who want a voice. And I think everybody wants a voice mm -hmm. to some extent. They may not be public about it, but send me an email. Tell somebody else to tell me. Just get your opinion out. And then who doesn't want to have fun? Yes. And when you have those four E's, you are going to succeed. It's really just a question of do you have enough time to incrementally, incrementally improve fast enough? And when you compound your, your incremental improvements, you go from here to there, like all of a sudden you get to that inflection point and you look around, and you go, oh my God, what have we done? I remember many, many times walking in the three floors of this, this office building and seeing people, I go, I didn't even know that person works here. Like, 
I don't know anybody in that room. Which is a good thing, right? That's that's a good feeling. <laughs> because, because, I mean, I used to know everyone. When, when we got up to like, I think 175 to 200, yeah. I knew everybody's name, I knew their backgrounds, everything. But now with 500 people, it just became impossible. And I said, who is that person? Well, they've been here two years. What? Oh, I, felt, I really, I felt terrible. I really did feel terrible. But when you see the, all these people doing things, you don't even know what they're doing. Yes. But you can see that they're energized and they're passionate. You know that your organization doesn't depend on you anymore. And that's, that's a beautiful thing. It's, it's so gratifying to see a business grow when you're not needed. That is that's powerful. Probably one of the, it's, it's probably something that a lot of people have a, a difficult time because sure. everybody wants to feel needed and everybody wants to feel like they're important. Well, you actually are more important by having less need to be there. I'm going to tell you one other story, though. Please. My, one of my sons, he, he, I think he was 11 at the time. He said, okay, dad, so what do you do? You're CEO. I said, all right, so what I do is I create a vision. I then get alignment with the people. Right. And then we get execution. And he said, well, dad, so you don't do any real work, do you? I guess I don't. You felt a little inflated, like, really? No, well, I work hard all day. You don't, you don't do any work. You're just thinking. That's work, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. It's, that's, it, it's fun. You can tell. My wife even says he goes to his playground every day. And she meant it. And I think when, when you are expanding yourself and you're not stagnant and you really feel like you're empowering everybody else, mm. Like we can talk about empowering this. I actually think people are already empowered when they come in and that it's up to you not to disempower them, which happens in a lot of organizations. So when you are empowering and feeling that you're making a difference, that's fun. I mean, how does that, it's not even work. It's not work. It's just, it's just what you do. And it doesn't matter if you're on the job or you're at home. You're evolving. You're trying to get better as a parent, as a grandparent. You're trying to get better as a spouse. You're trying to get better in the community. You're trying to make your community better. Yes, and you're, yes. you're experimenting to try to make your, or figuring out how do I communicate better? How do I allow other people to communicate better? Yes. This is like a constant type of evolutionary thing, which means I mean, I will never run out of things to do because there's so many areas where I can improve. And for and example, Jay, what are some of those things that you that you talked earlier? You said you you felt good because you know who was the leadership of the company and what you were going to do in the in the uh, 2020, I believe it would be. Um, what were the things you that you look forward to doing now or that you want to do? Because you seem excited, like you're not Ramon. I'm sitting here just twiddling my thumbs and scrolling Netflix. Who is Jay today? Tell us. <laughs> That's good. So. Uh, the, the third thing, I needed to make sure that uh, we had achieved all the things that we wanted to do. And that, yeah. that was a check on that. So what I'm doing right now is giving back. I wrote the book. I've already told you about mm -hmm. uh, Lead from the Core. So that's to give back. Uh, second is I've joined five companies as an advisor on their board, including a public company mm -hmm. on the New York Stock Exchange. Wow, that is experimenting without fear. So uh, I'm on that, and I'm also on a lot of startup companies, too, in their seed round, A round, C round, and D round, and then this public company. That's fun. I'm teaching at Rice University in the, in the business school, the Jones Graduate School of Business. And Rice is, Rice is in Ohio? In, in, in Houston. Oh, Houston. Yes, sir. Houston. Okay. Yeah. So uh, teaching. On That's board, busy. You're, you're busy. Writing, there's probably other things that I'm doing, non some nonprofit boards too, and of, with my seven grandkids, those are my true. Those are those That's are it. seven. Those are my seven startups. So <laughs> there's a lot I can do to be with them. But yes, that that's just squeeze them, kiss them, hug them, yes, and, and eat them up. That's, and that's, that's what, what life is about, isn't it? It's about that. I mean, I'm, I'm a bit younger than you, but I must say at almost the age of 50, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of myself, you know, where do I, where will I be in 10 years, 20 years? Jay, I want to go back to something you talked about diversity and diversity of opinions and things to follow up on that. Can you talk about what do you say to Megan, metaphorically, that has a different opinion from Jay, possibly 
viscerally different. Can you just talk about that meaning? Because diversity of opinion does not mean that we agree. It means we want difference of opinions and all that. So can you talk about that? And I say that because one of my friends, Glenn Lundy, he hosts one of the largest, fastest growing podcasts on Clubhouse called Breakfast with Champions. And he says, there's no growth in agreement, something like that. I could be getting it wrong. So if you understand what I'm asking, can you just talk about that a bit more where you have 10 people, you want them to be on your team, but yeah. Megan disagrees. What happens? Okay. Well, the first thing you say is thank you. Okay. Thank you for disagreeing. And it's like, oh, I didn't think you were going to say that. Mm. So just saying thank you is a big thing. And if somebody says something publicly, you don't go, oh, we did that five years ago. It's not what you think. It's actually what you do. What's really more important, it starts with how you think, obviously. But what you do, what your behavior is, that is your core. That's your core values. It's how you behave. So you, how you react to disagreement is really important. But you also encourage it. Our third core value is to express yourself. Mm -hmm. And what that means is we tell people, like in the first week, I do an hour on our four, four E's. And I'd say, if you hear me say something and you think, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not even alignment with what he said we were supposed to do. Then tell me, I want to improve. I want mm -hmm. to hear from you. So just if you want to take me aside and go, Jay, um, with all due respect, you've told me this and you've told me that, and they don't seem to agree. Could you help me understand what you mean? And I've got another idea if you'll listen. Of course, I'm going to listen, but you know, they're always a little tentative. And it, when you're in a position of power, it inherently freaks people out. And they, they're afraid that they're going to look stupid or they're going to overstep their boundaries, or they just say, you know, you're, never, you're always supposed to make your boss look good. Well, making me look good makes me be right more times than not. Mm -hmm. And I want to hear, you're doing the work. You're talking to the customer. You're doing this process that we say will be better. And if you actually have a better idea, let's hear it. And if you don't want to talk to me, talk to somebody else, but let's get it out. I love so it. That sounds to me like that's the safe place, Jane. It doesn't mean still Jay may come back as the leader and say, thank you, Megan. I've analyzed it, slept on it, heard it all. We're still going to go left. But Absolutely. at the very least, you've heard it you've digested it. And I think that's better than most leaders, which the person feels they can't be heard. You're going to be fired because you disagree. That's the part you're saying, we don't want that. We want to hear it all. Exactly. And, and another thing that you do is if you're not going to do it, tell them why. Got it. It could be that it's a great idea, but you can't prioritize it because there are a lot of great ideas. And look, companies, when you have a lot of people speaking up and the whole idea is to evolve, there are more ideas than you can actually execute. So then it, you have to ruthlessly prioritize. And it could be that Ramon comes up or Megan comes up and says, yes, this is a great idea. And I go, you know, you're right, that is. But we can't do that yet. We'll put, it, it's like when you tell your kid, they say they want, they, I want this toy. And you go, great, we'll put it on the list. That's right. Go, okay, good. But here you really do have a list. Yes. And you just put, you have to put it near the bottom because you just can't get to it yet. But letting them know that it was a good idea and you can't do it because something else is prioritized, tell them what you prioritized over it. They like that. They, they respect it. Just, and if you're going to do it, do it and let them know when you've done it. In fact, when customers have great ideas and they tell you, hey, I've got this great idea, mm -hmm. you listen to them, you tell them that. And if you ever do implement it, write back to that customer and say, remember that idea you gave us in a year ago? <laughs> or last month, we're doing it. Thank you. And let them know that, oh man, you will have a customer for life. And they're going to tell everybody, they go, you're not going to believe this. I gave them an idea. Of course, I didn't think they'd ever do anything with it. And they actually did it. And then they wrote, they wrote me back and told me they did it. I mean, yes. isn't that People great? Love it. It's like the public pat on the back. Jay, Jay going to the shop floor and saying, Ramon or Megan, you did great work. It makes your day. <laughs> it's so easy. Yeah. This is this is about this is about bringing humanity back into the workplace. Mm. It's so it's true. about personal development, generosity, and respect. If I mean, is that too much to ask to have a little respect in the workplace yeah. to bring humanity back in there? Yes. Numbers are important. Making plan budgets. 
metrics, accountability, for sure. You have to have that. But can we be just a little respectful to each other? Can we Absolutely. listen? Can we just say, yeah, you're doing a good job? Can we listen to what they want to do for their own personal lives? If they want to be a CEO outside of your company, should we ask, like, what do you want to do with your life and give them the opportunity to grow into that? I just think it's common sense. No, Jay, listen, I love it. And I, I want to respect this time because I want you to say yes to me when I invite you on here again or other opportunities. <laughs> but Jay awesome. Steinfeld, anything you wanted to add, this has been amazing. And I hope everybody, I think your website is so clear and beautiful. JaySteinfeld.com, lead from the core, the four principles for profit and prosperity. We'll have all this in the show notes. I have my copy. You should get yours too. But Jay, any, anything I didn't ask you or anything you wanted to add for today? Podcast. Uh, just the goal is to help people become better than what they ever believe possible. Mm. And hopefully, Ramon, if I've helped anyone in your audience do that, then I will have considered today a success. It is a success. And everybody, again, that was Jay Steinfeld. You can go to his website and uh, find his book on Amazon. I've got it. You should too. This is Ramon Ray, founder of smarthustle.com. If you're hearing the sound of my voice, we love a review. We love you to tell everybody else what we do at Smart Hustle is to inspire and educate small business owners to start and grow successful businesses so they can live the lives they want, provide for their families, and support their communities. I'm Ramon Ray. Check this out and more at smarthustle.com. Jay, thank you.